Thank you, Chad, for the wonderful introduction. I'm Varun Singh. I'm CEO of Callstats.io, a startup based out of Helsinki, Finland. Uh, Callstats' basic promise is to help uh, detect, diagnose, and uh, deploy fixes for our customers in real time. Uh, although today's talk is a bit more about how you guys can build uh, your own platforms in a more elegant way using the statistics API from WebRTC. Uh, I'm going to first of all begin with uh, with a small refresher about uh, the protocols for multimedia. Uh, so when we talk about multimedia systems, especially like WebRTC, uh, there are a bit of things that uh, multimedia system needs to do. So one, it needs to capture audio and video. Um, these come in a couple of um, codecs. For video, you have H.264, you have VP8, VP9, and more codecs in the future. For, uh, for audio, there is G711, G722, and Opus. Uh, and typically, an endpoint, which is a multimedia system, captures this, uh, the, uh, the audio and the video packets, uh, or frames at first, then packetizes them and sends them over the network. Uh, on the receiving side, the endpoint uh, receives these packets, uh, depacketizes them, uh, has a jitter buffer to make sure that plays out correctly, and then uh, basically renders it. Uh, and uh, so just a bit about uh, how we do this. Typically, we use a protocol called RTP, uh, which stands for Real-Time Transport Protocol. Typically, in, this, on, in the next few charts, I'm only going to talk about uh, senders and receivers to just to make sure that uh, you pe people understand uh, how this works. So in these cases, the media is only flowing in one direction, but with WebRTC, media flows in both directions. Uh, so, in this case, you have uh, a sender and receiver. Uh, it's in uh, the sender is en encapsulating the audio and the video packets and sending them across the network. Uh, al along with the media packets, it might send uh, protection packets, it might send uh, retransmissions, it might send repair packets, so on and so forth, in case packets get lost. At the receiver, the uh, the receiver is receiving these packets and playing them out. It needs some information uh, to to play out these packets in synchronized manner, especially when it's getting audio and video. So it has a jitter buffer, and uh, and it also does some monitoring and reporting so that uh, endpoints can look at the data locally and see if the media is being rendered properly or not. With RTP, there is also a control protocol associated with it. It's called RTCP, which is RTP control protocol. And there is, uh, of course, to, uh, to create a feedback loop between the sender and the receiver. As I said, uh, the receiver needs to play back audio and video uh, in a synchronized manner. So the sender sends some timing information from the sender to the receiver so that uh, it can play them out in an accurate, smooth manner so that there is no uh, AV desync problems. Uh, at the receiver, uh, needs to send data back to the sender so that the sender can adapt. Uh, typically, the, this is carried in RTCP's receiver reports, or called RTCP RRs. Uh, they have rough statistics and some congestion queues, uh, which helps the sender do short-term adaptation. And when I talk about short-term adaptation, this can be uh, automatic bandwidth control or adapting the media uh, bit rate or resolution or frame rate based on the network characteristics uh, observed at the, at the receiver. So this was a quick uh, recap of the protocols associated with, uh, with multimedia uh, and today with WebRTC. So we do all this mainly because every application service uh, wants to have really high quality video and audio. And typically, that requires, especially in WebRTC case, that uh, the latencies for these uh, systems to be low so that you can hear and interact with the people in real time. And the talk before, for example, talked about like what happens uh, when this doesn't happen, uh, or what happens when uh, these situations are encountered, and one of the proposals was to like do a pretest, uh, and the pretest is all good because you know you make sure that uh, the call starts off very well. But if the calls are long enough, uh, 
th there might be issues that people may encounter during a call. This might be people, you know, someone turns on their microwave or people walk out of the door, lose connectivity, and so on and so forth. So when we talk about WebRTC, we want to always say, you know, we want the highest quality of audio and video. But literally, the most important thing is not the highest quality audio video. You want optimal audio quality and optimal video quality. Uh, but the most important part is to have interactivity. And that is guaranteed a bit by having lower latency. And when I talk about low latency, I also mean like lower one-way delay or lower RTTs. They're all synonyms for the same metric. For example, in this chart, you can see uh, that this is a call which is about 260 seconds. Uh, the the y-axis is the delay or the the one-way delay measured by the endpoints. Uh, what you see is also a red line, which is the ITUT standard for audio latency. Typically, when you say uh, the audio latency should be below this for a call to be considered uh, good. So, and, and in the chart, you can see that the audio latency from one, uh, one endpoint to the other uh, is spiky. At the beginning of the call, it's lower, but towards the end of the call, around 200 seconds in, you see a three-second spike. Uh, and uh, that's not it. The, the spikes continue after. So one of the most important things is about being able to measure this and to be able to uh, respond to customer uh, support tickets when they say you know they had a bad quality of experience. A bit more about quality of experience is the ability to measure the user experience. And when we talk about WebRTC, uh, the most important thing we talk about is the call experience, the so duration of the call uh, from the start to the end. And, and you want to be able to measure uh, the quality of experience by collecting metrics. And you also want to collect uh, user interactions. For example, did they turn off their audio? Did they turn off their video at some point? Did they switch from like their camera to screen sharing? Did they switch back and so on and so forth? Because you want to be able to correlate uh, the metrics that you see during the call experience uh, with user, ac user actions. For example, if, they, if you see a video bitrate drop, you want to know it was because the user indeed uh, turned off their video. Then you can speculate why they may, they may have done that later on. The other bit, uh, and it was also uh, an important factor in the talk by Google earlier on by uh, Daniel Peterson, was the call setup time and how important it is. So when you build applications, you want to be able to measure like when the call started, uh, when was the interaction made, and when did the first media frame arrive, uh, so that you can say the call has begun. And that's an important aspect, because if the call takes too much time to set up, people might get uh, a bit annoyed or just leave, and you might have a larger fall off uh, in, uh, in your usability of the product. Uh, at the end of the call, typically, you've seen with Skype and uh, various other applications that they end uh, at the end of the call, they ask the end user how the quality of the call was. It's really important to ask the right question, because if you do not ask the right question, you might get really weird feedback. So being able to say, like, did you experience uh, specific annoying issues with the video or with the audio is a better thing than just saying, please rate the quality of the call, because you might get uh, answers like, uh, for example, like one of the times uh, we've seen, uh, uh, an end user said, I did not see Mary. And uh, yeah, it's an interesting question. You'd wonder who Mary is and if she was expected to be on the call, for example. Um, <clears throat> more about measuring user experience, uh, depending on what type of service you build, for example, Hangouts and other services, uh, when you pass a URL or give a URL to a person, uh, the video immediately starts. Uh, rendering. In those cases, you want to be able to measure the page load times uh, and so on and so forth to make sure that the, the call starts immediately uh, in a snappy manner. You want to make sure that all the libraries that uh, the call depends on are loaded ahead of time. And if you have any issues with uh, caching or with some JavaScripts, you want to make sure that you are able to measure those at the other, at the beginning of the call. 
the other thing is that not all calls work that way. There are other uh, calls where, for example, on Slack, you press a button and are initiated into a call. You want to actually see what happens at the point when you uh, press that button. So you want to be able to capture all those aspects uh, of the call initialization process just to make sure that you have uh, all the data available for you to measure uh, user experience. So as, as I said, so there are a lot of things that uh, you can do in terms of measurement. And typically, you can do that at the network level. So you, know, you get bits per second, you get RTT. So those are network statistics. And the second level of information you want is the multimedia statistics. You want to know if a frame was rendered, if uh, there were burst frame losses, uh, did all, uh, was the audio and the video played out synchronized, uh, synchronously, so that you know that the pipeline is working uh, in a correct manner. Uh, above all, what you want to make sure is when you have these network metrics and the multimedia pipeline metrics, uh, you are able to create models out of them to, uh, that we call annoyances, so that you can say, for example, the resolution changed by too much. So you started at uh, 4K or 1080p, and uh, the video resolution dropped to 640p or 480p very quickly and over a very short period of time and maybe went back up to, uh, to HD video in a very short period. So th those things are annoying for users, for example, because the quality of the video has changed dramatically uh, over very short periods. And uh, by measuring those things, you can come up with your own uh, quality metrics, depending on the kind of service you're building. So there are some services where you want uh, like low frame rates, or in some others you want high frame rates and uh, maybe optimal uh, resolutions. And you can do that today by using the Get Stats API. So the Get Stats API uh, is at the top where it says that there's a interface on the peer connection uh, which you can call. This, uh, the response to the peer connection uh, or to the get stats API is asynchronous, so you call the API, and a uh, short time later, asynchronously, you get a callback which uh, gives you an answer about the data in it. You can call it at the peer connection level, or if you know which stream you're interested in, for example, an audio or a particular video stream, you can call the get stats on that particular stream. Uh, you can call the API as often as you want. Uh, typically, if you call it quicker than 150 milliseconds, you're going to like, probably get the same response back as you got a moment ago. Uh, and you can call the, by calling the API more often, uh, you can get a series of data which might show you the trend, for example, uh, what is happening. So is the bitrate increasing or is the bitrate decreasing? So that is one of the, the charts that you saw before was we're calling peer get stats more often, about every one second. Uh, here's an example. Uh, uh, for example, in this case, we are interested the, in the audio uh, latency, or in this case, audio track latency. Uh, we call the, the get stats on the peer connection. And this is a promise API, so uh, as soon as the, the data is available, the then function would be called. And if it fails, then the catch uh, would be called. So if there was some error in uh, get stats, uh, when you call get stats, if it was not implemented or, or so on and so forth, it, there would be a log error uh, displayed in the catch statement. And uh, as you can see, in this case, I'm just logging almost all the data out of the, the outbound statistics for the audio. And uh, the reason I did that was the RTP's, uh, RTP's RTT, or uh, round trip time, is measured at the sender. So you send a packet, and it sends something back, uh, and you measure the time taken for that interaction. So if you want to measure the RTT, you call the outbound RTP. You can see the output on the right side, where it, it says the packet sends, byte sent, and round trip time. In this case, the round trip time is in milliseconds, so it's 31 milliseconds. Uh, when we talk about uh, metrics, uh, another way of looking at it is that there is uh, media flowing between Alice and Bob in this case. Again, for simplicity reasons, I'm only showing media in one direction. 
Uh, and uh, you can gather statistics across the pipeline. So at the sender side, there, is, there are tracks that are audio video tracks that are put into a, a sender, which is an RTP sender, which sends the data over uh, the network or through an ICE transport. And at the receiver side, uh, the data is received on the ICE transport and uh, given to the RTP receiver where it depacketizes it and uh, sends it to the right track. So <clears throat> in most cases, you can call get stats on all these objects to get accurate information related to uh, that uh, particular stream, for example. So uh, I'm just gonna walk you through a quick example of this call between uh, two people. So there is a, a user zero and a, there's a user one. Uh, and I'm only sh using uh, the data that is going from user one to, uh, from zero to one, shown by the orange line. And we're just showing the frame width in this case. Uh, sorry, if it is frame width on the, on the top, I say frame height. Apologies for that. Uh, and, uh, and as you can see at the beginning of the call, the, the, the frame width is uh, 1080p. It quickly drops to uh, 640, I believe. Uh, and then remains constant for most of the period, and then around 1600 to 1800, it uh, it switches between um, low between the current and higher, and then comes back down. So at the tracks level, you can see uh, the data related to the tracks. So in this case, we are showing uh, the resolution. Uh, at the RTP sender level, you can look at the throughput. And for example, in this case, you can see the throughput is not always constant. Uh, it is like varying. At the beginning of the call, it goes up to uh, 2600, then drops. And there are quite a, uh, quite a moments where uh, it drops below one, uh, one megabit per second. And towards the 1600 and 1800, what you notice is that uh, the bandwidth drops quite a lot uh, very quickly and then goes back up and comes back down. So this is similar to uh, the frames. Uh, this might be one of the reasons why the frame uh, width was changing uh, at, in these periods of time. But it's also interesting because uh, we see these drops in the middle between 600 to 1200 uh, that do not really cause any uh, variation in the frame width uh, on the previous slide. It was basically flat from uh, the beginning till the end. So one of the things that we noticed was we went down to the ICE transport and we looked at uh, you know, what are the losses that we're seeing on the same path. And what we notice is that there are uh, periods of 40% losses which kind of coincide in the beginning, or like at 400, 800, and 1200, we notice these kind of uh, uh, peaks in uh, uh, in packet loss, which perhaps indicate uh, why the the throughput or the media throughput dropped uh, in that period. But and the other thing that we notice is that around 1200 and 1400, you see spikes again, uh, which along with the fact that uh, the bandwidth also fluctuated in this period kind of is indicative of the fact that the, the congestion control tried to, to change the frame width and the resolution to see, uh, to overcome these losses and uh, in the lack of capacity in this period. So these are things that you can do uh, if you have data across the pipeline being able to like, go and investigate after the fact. So I'm just gonna walk you through another example of a simplified e-model. Uh, this is for G711. Uh, it's a recommendation from ITUT uh, from maybe 20, 25, 30, maybe even earlier uh, years ago. And what it basically says is the one-way delay from the, from the mouth to the ear uh, should be within bounds. So at the highest level, uh, if you want users to be very satisfied, the mouth to ear delay should be about 250 milliseconds. And uh, at, at the worst case, if it's above 500 milliseconds, then it's considered bad uh, or the user is dissatisfied. And this is fairly easy to implement uh, today because we have the Get Stats API. And uh, remember at the beginning of the on charts before, I talked about uh, the Get Stats API. Uh, so we're just repurposing that data again. So you have a selector which is only using the audio tracks, and we're looking at uh, the Get Stats API, 
only for uh, for the audio track. And in this case, we are pulling it at every uh, one second interval. So that's why there's a timeout. Uh, that will get the RTT measurements uh, every one second, and we can look at the variation over a longer period of time. The next thing we want to do is we want to be able to look at the, the outbound RTP. As I said before, the, the round trip time or the RTT is only measured at uh, the sender side. So we want to look at the, the metrics at the sender side, uh, which is the outbound RTP and the local statistics for that audio stream. And uh, what we're going to do is every time we get an R round trip time measurement, we're going to like put it into an array so that we can calculate an average um, over the lifetime. So you can either take uh, from the beginning of the call, or you can take 10 second samples or 20 second samples, uh, or lo longer samples for measurements, uh, depending on how robust you want the metric to be. And once you have calculated the uh, the round trip time average, uh, you can divide that by two and pass that uh, to the simple E model, which would then go and compare it to, uh, to the graph that I'd shown at the beginning of the call. And you can log that, for example, in, in locally, or you can send that data uh, to your logging service where you would be able to show the variation of uh, the call quality for that particular person over a period of time. So this was just an example, and you're wondering what you could do more. Uh, it's not just about the Get Stats API. You can also attach yourself to the iStates. So there's something uh, called um, on iState change. You want to uh, attach yourself to that, because wh whenever it goes to disconnected state, for example, or if it fails, you want to be at the application level, be aware of the fact that uh, you lost connectivity or, um, or the connectivity is only momentarily lost. Because you can build uh, things, for example, when a user complains that you know they did not have very good quality or they could not hear a person. For example, in our case, what we've done is we have this visualization where you have three participants in a call. They're, uh, they are present for about 16 to 18 minutes. Uh, and we have this metric called disruption, which means that either they lost connectivity, uh, so the network address changed, uh, or there was low available capacity, or very high RTT, or, or very high losses. So in this case, you can see that by the gray periods uh, on the charts, uh, the, the most important thing to notice is that the third user, AEE, is, is disrupted for about eight minutes with uh, this user, E6, and uh, for in this case, it's because that he he was experiencing very high uh, latencies uh, during that period. Uh, so at the high level, if you go and look at your logs, you can easily look at this disruption, for example. Uh, and if a user complains, you're kind of aware that you're also seeing the same behavior that the user is complaining about. And then you can, uh, as a second step, go and uh, try to diagnose what those reasons might be. Uh, the common uh, occurrence that we hypothesized earlier was the fact that when an, whenever you have like low uh, low bandwidth situations or losses uh, and you can't hear the other person, typically, at least I go and uh, you know try to switch off my video and sometimes turn off my audio and then turn them back on to see if the person will be able to hear me. Uh, better, right? So I turn off my video in the process to see if that if that happens. And in this case, there are three people in the call again, and uh, all three are disrupted using the same dis uh, same def definition of disrupted as before uh, at the same time. And what we see now is that the users are actually turning off their audio or uh, turning off their video and turning them back on. So each line represents uh, like their interaction. And this is another way of looking at uh, like how people are self-diagnosing their issues by turning off video. And, uh, and this is uh, how we do uh, analytics. And, uh, and uh, that's why you don't only need data from the Get Stats API, but you want to like, leverage as much information and context that you can gather uh, from your application. If you're interested in more about Get Stats, uh, I'm one of the co-authors with Harold Alvastrand from Google uh, about the Get Stats API. It's available 
add a URL listed there. We recently updated the document uh, maybe six, eight weeks ago. We're going to update it again over the next few weeks uh, before the end of the year. So if you're more interested in using the Get Stats API, uh, you can have a look there. Uh, the other thing that we learned over the last few years um, is uh, that you know we our customers needed to deploy more turn, more turn servers. Some of them needed to go down to uh, introducing TCP support. For example, this summer there was uh, an app or a product which uh, was targeting, uh, let's say. 12 to 18 year olds, so people uh, or children at school, and uh, they released the app just before summer began or bef just after the schools closed down. And uh, you know the app was available over the summer, and uh, like about the week when schools reopened, what they saw was you know they were seeing more f uh, more failures on their network or on their calls, and also there are a lot more turn. Uh, servers be, were being used. And one of the things that uh, was causing this was when people went back to school, uh, the, the schools have very restrictive firewalls that they did not anticipate and during the summer did not notice uh, because they were at home and the home uh, typical normal turn servers were okay. But at the, at the school, they noticed that you know, because of the restrictive firewalls, they, were, uh, there was, uh, they needed to deploy turn TCP that happened on a particular like day of the week, uh, which did, they did not anticipate for the first few months that they were in production. The other things that we've noticed is that our customers start to detect crashes and disruptions, and the talk before and the talk after are going to talk about like how you can reset up the call or uh, handle these crashes in a more ele elegant way. So. The crashes might be because of the pipeline crashing, or because the screen sharing plugin crashing, or even loss in network connectivity. So to summarize, my talk covered a bit the basics of RTP and RTCP, the protocols required for uh, carrying audio and video, uh, a brief introduction to get stats API. Uh, the talk before mine already introduced it uh, at a, a certain level, so I hope you have more uh, use cases uh, or more ideas about using the Get Stats API in your own apps. Uh, and I showed a simplified e-model that you can use today if you're using G711 uh, audio codec. Thank you.